if you'll, if while you're in the Gospel of John uh, this morning, I'm going to be uh, looking at uh, verse 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. If you take notes, I've entitled the message, The Resurrection, The Resurrection. Before we uh, look at this, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open it up for us. Holy Spirit, we come to you in thanksgiving for all the Bible and this verse, an important verse, a lovely verse, a wonderful verse. Uh, we pray as we look into it that you would open up our hearts. You would speak to everyone here, Lord. And if there's uh, one here listening who doesn't know Christ as Savior, pray that, that this verse might open their heart and you might call them to yourself. And for others, Lord, pray that you edify us with this, uh, with this message, that you would help us, Lord, to have a better understanding of the resurrection. And also, Lord, pray that you would be glorified in it as well. Everything we do, we want to do to glorify you. And that includes and especially the preaching of your word. May it go out and we know it never comes back void. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, uh, he may die. Uh, though he die, he shall live. Now, many people look at the resurrection, and we talk about that on Easter. But uh, actually, the resurrection, the resurrection isn't just an Easter topic. The resurrection is an everyday topic. But before I get into that, let's just take a, a, a look at our verse and the, and the backdrop of it. Our text is the Lord's response uh, to Martha's conversation or her confession of faith to him. Now look at verses 21 to 24. Here we pick up the conversation. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that uh, whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said uh, to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. You see, she knew already about God's resurrection. She knew that. She knew more than the disciples did. <laughs> because when they crucified him, the disciples went fishing. They went home. She knew that he would be resurrected. Then Jesus answered her with our text. He says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked her a question. Do you believe this? Now look at verse 27. Here's what Martha said. She said, yes, Lord. Yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she said Christ, he's talking about the Messiah. The Jews knew all about the Messiah. They just didn't believe that he had come. She did. Then our Lord was led to, to Lazarus' tomb. And look at verses 43 and 44. Now, before you do that, let me just remind you that it says in the earlier verses in, in that, they went, Jesus delayed going to, to Bethany. He delayed doing that because he wanted to make sure that that everybody knew that Lazarus was dead. And 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 the Bible even went to the extent of saying that when he asked him to open the tomb, that it stunk. Decomposition had set in. There was no question that Lazarus was dead, period. Nobody could say he was in there faking. He was just wrapped up in cloth and that uh, that he was alive. There could be no question that he was dead. And Jesus wanted that to happen because he wanted people to see the miracle of him resurrecting Lazarus. Now look at verses 43 and 44. Jesus, uh, uh, here we hear Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped in a cloth. I just picture that. A large group of people standing in front of a tomb that stinks of death. And one man, Jesus Christ, comes and he cries, Lazarus, come out, with a loud voice. So everybody could hear it was him who said it. Come out. And he comes out. Now here's a question. 
in that text, he says, he came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. How did he come out? He was wrapped. Nobody picked him out. Nobody took him out. God levitated him out. That's the only way he could have went from that tomb to, to come out and come out of that tomb was if he levitated out. There's no other way. There's no other way of explaining it. And levitation to God is no is nothing compared to raising somebody who's died. That's an interesting fact, isn't it? There's so many miracles in that in that uh, in the account of Lazarus and his resurrection. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna look at a few of them. But there's there's so many miracles, and that was one of them. Lazarus come out, and he floated out of that tomb. There are many spiritual takeouts in this text. And let me just look at a few of them for you. Look at the first two words. How about that for a blessing of comfort? The term, I am. Interesting term. In the King James Version, Mike, the term I am is used 700 times. Jesus himself used it in the Gospel of John eight times. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. So Martha would have understand uh, would have understood or and recognized that Jesus, when he said, "I am the resurrection," that he was claiming to be God. How comforting that must have been to Martha to know that God incarnate was saying that He was the resurrection and that her brother would be raised from the dead, that He would resurrect. How comforting it is, is it for us to know that the God of comfort will come to us and help us in our times of needs, in our sorrows, because he is the God of comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 backs that up. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our adversities. Martha was blessed. Are you blessed with knowing that God incarnate has claimed you as one of his children, as one of his disciples? Does that blessing ring in your heart? Or do you just think you're a Christian? I'm living a Christian life. I want to tell you something. There's no greater there's no greater gift in this world. There's no greater value in this world than knowing that you are a child of God, a believing, born again child of God, living for Christ as best you can every day. Nothing trumps that. Nothing. Because everything else in this world is temporal. Everything else in this world is going to be is going to be gone. How many times have we have you thought about all the we have we have a member here that has a house that was built in the 1700s and one day I was talking with him he says I can't even imagine all the people that lived in my house and I told God once I don't own my house you own my house I'm just mowing your lawn and that's all I'm doing God God is the greatest blessing any human being can have and all of us that know Christ as our Savior, we need to understand that we're more than Christians. We're more than believers. We are the blessed children of the sovereign God of the universe. And he has sent his son, as we learned with our communion table, he has sent our, his son to die for us, to claim us as his own. Jesus Christ was the kinsman redeemer. That's what his resurrection was all about. You see, Martha knew, Martha knew, and I pray each and every one of you know that Jesus will comfort, deliver, and resurrect all of his people, not just Lazarus. Actually, Lazarus got a bonus. He got resurrected twice. He got resurrected and back to this life, and on the judgment day, he'll be resurrected again. And the authority, and this is very important, the authority to do that is displayed in the very next section of our text. Look at it. 
When he said, I am the resurrection and the life, when he said that, he was showing the authority that he had to do that. That means Jesus just wasn't the messenger of the resurrection. He is the embodiment. He is the power source of the resurrection. Don't believe me? Let me give you a proof verse. Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And Paul backs that up in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Speaking of Jesus, he wrote, He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Nobody resurrected from the dead before Christ. People that were truly dead. And let me define dead. Dead is absolutely defined as cessation of living tissue, period. And how do we know it, a person is dead? Because they stink. Death is decomposing the mortal body. I am the term. I am the resurrection and the life. He said that as an assurance to let Martha know and to let every believer that, read that reads that know that, that faith in Christ always leads to life, not death. It, it always leads to life. Especially life after death. For those who trust in Jesus, death is not the end of the story. Listen, I'm going to tell you why. Because when God created Adam and Eve, he created them to be immortal. They would never die. That's true. So when sin came on the scene, that changed. What changed was they sinned against God, so God put a curse on them. He said, okay, I'm putting time in motion. Time began when God, when God uh, uh, judged Adam and Eve in the, uh, in the garden. When he did that, time began. And in that judgment, Adam had, I think it was 976 years, hundreds of years to live, and then he would his body would perish. Didn't mean that he wasn't immortal anymore. He didn't take that away. What he took away was his flesh, because it was his flesh that caused him to sin. So the immortality of God's creation, human beings, has never changed. The only thing that changed from the garden in Genesis 1 and 2 was that sin was allowed in by God. He allowed it in that Jesus Christ might be known, that he would call out a people from the world. And in doing that, and in doing that one event, he knew that it would be a resurrection. And the first one that would resurrect was Jesus Christ. For those who trust in Jesus, death is not the end of the story. John 3.16 is the gospel call. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. To be clear, that verse does not say, if you believed in Jesus Christ, your body functions would never stop. It didn't say that. It simply said, Jesus said, you would never die. You have to understand something. Your flesh is, and, and the Bible makes this abundantly clear. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Our creator inspired Paul to write 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. That tells us that we are composed of three elements, individual elements, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole, here it comes, spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at his coming. Now there are some who think that, well, that's not true. It's just a spirit and it's a body. No, if it says spirit, soul, and body, it means spirit, soul, and body. And, and in Ecclesia, and that's three parts. The body's just one part. Ecclesiastes Chapter 12, verse 7 tells us when our bodies die, we return to our maker. Here's what, uh, here's what uh, uh, Solomon wrote. The dust returns to the earth, your body, as it was. 
and the spirit returns to God who gave it. That's pretty clear stuff. And in another place, he says that eternity is written on man's heart. So we that's why we fear death. We know there's something, but the world doesn't know what it is. And they, they assume it's not good. And they're right. Without Christ, it isn't good. And, and 2 Corinthians 5.8 backs all of that up. Here Paul says, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The very moment a believing person leaves this earth and is transferred from this earth to the eternal realm, they're present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. And if you're unsaved, there's no difference. You're still, you still are an immortal being, except now if you leave here, with your sins, if that happens, then you're going to be transferred to the kingdom of darkness, hell, which is a holding tank until great judgment day and a lake of fire. You'll be in a lake of fire forever and ever. How do we know that's true? Luke, Luke 19 talks about the rich man and Lazarus, another Lazarus, not the one in our John text. Lazarus was, was in paradise, a place where the Old Testament saints went because they couldn't go to heaven because their Old Testament saints' sins were just covered over by animal blood. It took Jesus Christ to, to shed his blood. So between their life and Jesus' death and resurrection, they were put in a place called paradise. How do we know that's true? Because Jesus told a repentant thief when he asked him to remember him, he said, you will be with me in paradise today. So all that being said, he came for that one reason, and that was to shed his blood. And, and the soul and the spirit of the saved go directly to heaven, and the soul and the spirit of the dead go directly to hell. And how do we know it's true? Luke 19, Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man calls up. And it's the parable, actually. And he talks, he says, Father Abraham, because Abraham was with Lazarus. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my brethren so that, they'll, so that they won't come to this place. And what if uh, Abraham say? He says, no, there's too great of a gulf. We can't do it. We can't do it. Oh, and he also said, uh, send, send Lazarus to put a drop of water on my tongue. Now, that's a body. It's not a spirit. And, he, and he, he says, we can't. There's too big of a gulf between us because hell was in the center of the earth as well. You understand that? So the fact of the matter is, when your body perishes, your soul and your spirit is going to one of two domains. You're either going to the kingdom of darkness or you're going to the kingdom of glory. It's that simple. Calvin, John Calvin. He rightly points out death itself. Listen to this. Death itself is a sort of emancipation from the bondage of death. Do you understand that? Death itself is an emancipation from the, from the bondage of death. Every one of us here are bound to die. We're all going the flesh is going to die, but your soul and your spirit is not. Because God made man to be immortal. What was the point of Jesus coming here if when we die, we don't have a soul or a spirit? We're just dead. What's the point? In 2 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 5.53, Paul explained this, this body being sown imperishable or perishable and being raised imperishable. It's 1 Corinthians 15.53. Paul explained it this way. For this perishable body, the thing we're sitting in right now, must put on the imperishable. You can't get to heaven in this body. Why? Because your body is perishable. And this mortal body must put on immora, uh, immortality. So when we leave this place, we're given an immortal body. We're given an immortal body to house ourselves in. How do we know that's true? Because in Revelations, I think it's, uh, I'm going to take a shot at 12.6. Uh, it says, uh, the martyrs were crying out, how long, O Lord, before our blood is avenged? He wanted God to go down and punish those people that had killed all, their, all the people, uh, uh, all the believers down there. And what, did, and what did God say in return? He says, give them a robe for now, for more of your brethren must die. See, to God, death isn't what we think it is. 
It's a transference from one kingdom to another. And death is and death comes in many vehicles. It comes in a vehicle of war. It comes in a vehicles of, of uh, people uh, falling down. It comes in, in, uh, in, in the vehicle of old age. It comes in many vehicles. And all its and all its purposes is to take the imperishable body we all have and 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 put it in the ground where it came from. And so the soul and spirit is freed from it. So in a sense, what Calvin was saying was we're emancipated from the bondage of death. That's simple. And and <clears throat> and so when Christ raised Lazarus from the dead that demonstrated that he had the power to change death to life, both physically and spiritually. Why? Because he raised his, his mortal body back up. But there came a point when Lazarus died again, and that body stayed in the ground, and he was given an immortal body. And using the term the resurrection and the life, Jesus was referring to life now, and the eternal life. He's referring to two things. And it's a very, this is a very important thing to try to wrap your head around. Whether you know it or not, whether you know it or not, every single one of you that are sitting here today have already experienced a resurrection. Do you know that? Every single born again Christian have already experienced a resurrection. Now, how do we know that? Because the term resurrection, I looked it up online, the term resurrection means the act of bringing the dead back to life. The act of bringing the dead back to life, okay? And is it not true that before you were called, you were spiritually dead to God? Were you not spiritually dead to God? And did he not resurrect you from your spiritual death and give you a new life? Colossians 2.13, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, Christ, having forgiven us, forgiven us all our sins. Do you understand that? So it's fair to say being made alive in Christ, you've been resurrected to a new life. Your spiritual, uh, you have been resurrected from the spiritual death you were chained to in the world. Think about that. Think about who you were before you were saved. Think about the life you lived. Think about the priorities you had in life. Think about the way you looked at everything. Draw a line, say, okay, that's enough of that. Now let me see how I am now. You were dead to God. Ephesians 2 1, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were all dead. And he resurrected us, how? By calling us with an irresistible call. When, when the day came on February 23rd, when God said to Brian, Brian, come forth. What he did was he showed me who he was in relation to who I was. And I realized that I was a sinner in need of a savior. And so did you. You cannot become a born-again Christian. You cannot have life in Christ unless you know you're a sinner and you repent of that sin. There's no other way. And isn't that what happened? You were dead in sin, and Christ resurrected you to a new life. So it's fair to say being made alive in Christ has made uh, that you've been resurrected from the spiritual death that you were chained to. You didn't make the decision for Christ. He called you. Ephesians uh, 1, 4 says, and you hath he chosen before the worlds were formed. He took you out of the chains, the bondage of the old life, the natural life, and he adopted you into his family. You think he put you there if you, were, if you weren't immortal? You think he would put you there if you were filled with sin? No, but that's the problem with the church today. The evangelical church today is filled with counterfeit Christians. They all have the Bible. They have a choir. They throw money in a bucket, a communion table. They do all of that, but they're not changed. They haven't been resurrected from the dead. 
the spiritually dead. They have not been resurrected. And so they live each day really not much different than the day before they claimed to be a Christian. Before they grabbed the title, went to a church, picked up a book, they were no different. But if you are different, then that means that you were resurrected from this world and the bondage of sin. We've been resurrected and transferred. I'll give you the verse for that, Ron. It's uh, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, being transferred spiritually from the kingdom of darkness and being transferred into the spiritual realm of Christ is no different than being transferred by the vehicle of death where our perishable body are sinful. By the way, the, the reason a body has to go into the ground is because God did not regenerate your flesh. Your flesh is unregenerated. That's the battle you fight every day of your life as a Christian. You fight against yourself. You are always in a constant state of civil war. Your flesh wants, you, uh, wants its desires and it wants you to feed it. Your spiritual side, the Holy Spirit inside of you, fights against that and doesn't want you to do that, doesn't want you to appease the flesh. So that flesh has to go into the ground so that your soul and spirit, which is regenerated, goes to heaven. You're given an, uh, an immortal body, a temporary one. You're given one so that you can live that. You can live forever. That's what it's about. But the body has to go. if It's not regenerated. And here's the fun part. I don't have time to go into it, but it, I can show you it. When Jesus comes back again, in 1 Corinthians 15, look around verses, I'm going to say 40 to 55, 58, in, those, in that range. He comes back, he takes the bodies that you're sitting in right now, that's imperishable. He takes those bodies and he regenerates them into perfect bodies that are regenerated. So what you have right now is what you're always going to have. And you know why he, that has to happen? Because if he didn't, the devil would have defeated God. The devil said, oh, yeah, you got their soul and the spirit, but I got their flesh. No, you don't. They're going to be regenerated. I'm going to go wherever your body is. I don't care if you're vaporized, if you're atoms. We're talking about God. He can do all things. He's going to take your body and he's going to regenerate it and make it perfect. So now you'll have your body in a perfect state with a perfect spiritual, uh, being spiritually perfect, and your soul will be spiritually perfect. That's why it says in, in uh, Psalm 1611, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Why? You're not sitting there as, a, as, a, as, a, as an influence, as a, as a spirit. You have your body. As God's elect, you and I, as God's elect, have been resurrected into, uh, made into a new type of person. That's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5.17 said it, Ed says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. You're a new creature. Are you a new creature? That's a good question to ask yourself. Am I a new creature? Since I've become a Christian, am I living differently? Am I thinking differently? Am I acting differently? Or am I just not so much? Let me tell you something. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It means you've been freed from the bondage of sin, self, and the world. Do you know that? Do you feel that? I have to say this. I've taken a little, I've taken some heat from talking to people uh, and, and walking with people. And when I see people who call themselves Christians and don't live that way for any length of time, and I've watched them, and, and that's what we're called to do. We don't judge people by by uh, anything except the way they live their life. That's righteous judgment. In other words, if I go up to you and I'm judging you, everything I talk to you about has got to come from this book. Otherwise, it's my opinion. And my opinion is that's wrong. But if I'm saying to you, listen, God says you shouldn't be using his name in vain. What are you doing? Here it is right here. Let me show you. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, I slipped. Okay, just so you know. We do that. We're supposed to do that. 
And when it says judge not, he's referring to judging by your own biases. But we are to look at each other, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are to look at, at, at our walk with them through the eyes of this book. Galatians 6 1 says, If a brother be uh if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You can't do that if you're not helping your brother and sister by by walking with them and seeing them if they have any problems and helping them with it. That's the whole point of having a church, a fellowship. We grow together. We grow and we and we sharpen iron by and iron by talking about spiritual things. It means it also means we have a new life, a new strength, and a new commitment. Do you have a new commitment in your life? When you got saved, did you make a new commitment to Christ? Did you keep that commitment as best you could? When I say keep things, nobody's perfect, and I want to make that clear. This standard is so high, no human being except Jesus Christ could meet it because he was sinless. Our job is not to is not to be perfect. Our job is to be sanctified by God and and reach towards that as best we can. And that's the key words. And each and every one of us knows, knows what as best we can means, because it means something different to all of us. You're freed from that. You have a new purpose. You have a new plan. You have a new position. This is all new. Now you have a new in eternal inheritance. You're not going to the lake of fire. You're never going to be judged for sin. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't be condemned. God will never condemn you. And if anybody else condemns you, it doesn't matter. It only matters what God thinks. That's the blessing of your resurrection from the world and from yourself and sin. Now look at the last section. It's just a really a wonderful taste of the resurrection we're going to have when we leave this world. In the last section of our text, we see Christ's power in uh, resurrecting his people to eternal life. He says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's a promise by God. Then that should bring great comfort to every single believer, especially when death looks us in the face, that should be a, that should be a, you know, it, it's, I, I think it's fair to say this. I think it's fair to say we shouldn't fear death, but we could be a little concerned about how it happens. I'd say that. I'd say that's a fair statement. Our comfort is, is knowing, is in knowing rather that God's promise, he who believes in me, though he may die, shall live, belongs to every one of us. There's not one of you sitting here that knows Christ that is ever going to die. Your body's going to leave here. You're going to leave here. You have to leave here to go home. What does the Bible call us? Sojourners, pilgrims, just traveling through? That's all we are. And as a child of God, there's no reason for us to fear death or anything else. And I would remind you, I would remind you that even death is covered in Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. The word all things in the original Greek language means without exception. And that includes death. Death works out for your good. If you're a believer. Now, if you're listening to this and you're, and, and you're living without the biblical Christ in your life, you might call yourself a Christian, but you're not living like a Christian. You don't feel the big difference in your life from when you got saved to where you were before. If that's you, you have a lot to be concerned about. No, you have a lot to be worried about. I mean worried, very worried. Why? Because God makes it clear that every single soul outside of Christ, they're sinners. Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in another place it says, there is none righteous. No, not one. Not one human being will ever be righteous or ever was righteous except Christ. And in Romans 6.23 is the threat. He declares the penalty of sin for sin is death. 
You see, when you sin against an eternal being, God, then you have to die and that that payment has to be eternal. That's the currency of being in the eternal realm. Everything is done eternally. Which means without Christ, your sins have not been forgiven. So, oh, and I'll get to that in a minute. So you will not be spiritually resurrected from this world. You won't be. If you do not come to Jesus Christ, and you call yourself a sinner and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I've, I've lied. I've stolen. I've cheated. I've sworn. I've used your name in vain. You picked the sin. And it only takes one, by the way. It only takes one. Because the Bible says, if you break one of his commandments, you broke them all. It only takes one. If you, if you say that, that, um, that you have committed sin against him and you know it, and there's nobody that can say that they haven't. And if they did, they're a liar. They just made it, they just sinned then at that moment. Then all you have to do is admit that to God and ask him to forgive you. How hard is that? Don't we do that to our neighbors and everybody else? How hard is it to say, Lord, I've sinned against you in so many ways. I'm ashamed that I've done it. Please, I beg you in Jesus' name to forgive me. I don't even know Jesus yet, but would you forgive me in his name because I heard his name and I heard he saves. I want to be saved for my sin. Would you help me, Lord? And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you know what that means? That means if you go to him with a contrite heart, and you tell him you're a sinner and you want to repent of that sin and you want Jesus Christ in your life. He says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That means he'll give you salvation. I want to put a period there. OK, because that's a, that's a, that's a mark of punctuation. I'm a writer, so I had to learn all this stuff. It's a mark of punctuation that ends a thought and begins another thought. And the thought is this, you can't just say, I want to I want to be saved, forgive my sins and come into my life and save me. You can't just do that. You do it, but then you have to back it up because you have to love Jesus Christ enough in John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You have to love Christ enough to want to live for him, to keep his commandments. And no, wink, I'm not saying we're going to do it perfectly, but every day you're going to strive to change so that you become more Christ-like, more biblical than you were the day before. And nobody's going to get it perfect. Again, all of us know the best that we can do. We all know what that is. So if you come to Christ and you ask him to save you, and you live your life according to this book as best you can every day, then the promise, I am the resurrection and the life. And even though he died, he, uh, he dies, he shall live, belongs to you as well. All the promises in this book belong to you. Romans 8, 28, all things work together, belong to you. There is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus, belongs to whoever calls on Christ with a contrite heart. And then lives that, lives it. And that, dear friends, is where the rubber hits the road. There's millions of Christians professing Christians, I like to call them, that profess Christ, they know the Bible, they memorize the Bible, they throw lots of money in the bucket, they're always in church, but they don't live for him, and if you don't live for him, you don't love him. It's that simple. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's the only love that Jesus Christ accepts. If that's you, and you want to give up your, you want to give up your life, if you want to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his holy, of his uh, only son, all you have to do is repent. And if you want more information and you're online, you can call me. And if you're in the building, all you have to do is see me after the service. And I'll show you in his word how he wants you to be resurrected when you die and go home to glory, to a home of glory, rather than to the eternal pit of hell. The good news is that if you repent, that's that'll be the case. Now, in the midst of death, sorrow, and weeping, 
Jesus told Martha, I am the way, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Do you believe this? He said to Martha. Then, then confess like Martha, if that's you listening, then confess like Martha. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ and the Son of God. And if that's you, you say that and you believe that, then go out next week and live your faith every day so that the world can see that you've been resurrected in Christ.